recording. So I have started the recording. This is the chaos community call for February 11th. It's good to see everybody. Um, so in the, the minutes, I have a few things that I put on there. Obviously people can add things as they see fit, but I always like to kind of get these out in front of folks. Um, so I guess we can just start at the beginning. And, um, one is I brought the goal setting. So last week we had talked about goal setting for 2020. And um, Georg, you had dropped a few items in there as well. And I, just so folks know too, I'm also asking the same question to the chaos board. So there's a little bit of overlap here, I think sometimes between what um, board members are saying and kind of what's occurring here. So trying to gather all of those ideas um, collectively. So Gary, do you want to talk through any of the things you put in here? I can talk through some of these items as well. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Um, so the first one, Advanced Chaos Community Handbook. This was an idea to build out on, on a documentation of how the chaos project works. Right now, a lot of the processes that we have and how we engage is in the heads of our um, people, the members in the project. But as we are aging, we will see more turnover. And I think it's a good idea to write down how the chaos project works and make sure we communicate that more clearly because the chaos project as a whole has become a lot more complex than when we started three years ago. And uh, maybe even writing the handbook gives us a chance to reflect on how we are currently working and improve the processes that we do have. So that's, that's the idea behind the community handbook. Um, and I've started on it, but not really consistently worked on it. One of the items that I have a pull request for is documenting how we organize ChaosCon, but that's just one example. Okay. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is for folks on the, the call in your other communities that are not Chaos, have you seen community handbooks? I'm involved in an ACM conference that's been going for four years that talks about doing that a lot and hasn't yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful. Extremely. I, I think they sometimes take different forms, right? So okay. like Kubernetes has a pretty robust um, contributor website, okay. which I think contains a lot of stuff that you would find in a community handbook. Okay. Is it just a, do you have that link? I'd be kind of curious as to what like the top level headers are. Oh yeah, let me find it. Okay. Um, others in this, I guess part of, um, at least my, my thoughts are yes, super good idea. Um, <laughs> you can see there's a, a butt coming, but it, it's more, it's, it's more. So how do we like, produce a handbook and make that be the clear clear thing that people would gravitate to to participate in the chaos project. That's that's the point. Because we have that nice participate page, which I think is pretty clear. So kind of connections with that or I don't know what your thoughts are, Georg, or anybody. So somebody's talking, but it's super quiet. I think it's Brian. Other people can chime in. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting on Brian, I, I guess the question is, I mean, I think there, I think a couple of things that come up so far. I mean, one is, uh, I mean, is this sort of a landing page for contributors? That's one purpose. And the other is, is this more of a, uh, more for like an internal audience where work processes are documented, right? So people know like, how, you know, how you're supposed to, what are the steps that you go through to plan 
ChaosCon, for example, as as Georg mentioned. Um, uh, so, I, but I think those are like two different things. Like one, I mean, if we have a participate page through as a landing page for new contributors, that's one. But you know, Georg, are you, were you thinking more of as sort of an internal like a documentation so that you know when as as new people get involved in the community, they know what to expect when ChaosCon is coming up or or et cetera. But. Yes, I was thinking about the uh, internal audience. Okay. But I, I I think that makes sense for someone coming to the project to take a look at the handbook to understand what the community how the community works. Um, but mainly I want to document for the people in the community that we are on the same page. I see. So it's when you say like chaos con, it's for when new people start taking the lead on it, they just understand kind of the processes that have been, or perhaps working with say community bridge. <laughs> what, are, what are our current convoluted processes <laughs> to get money moved from point A to point B? Is that, or Google Summer of Code or Outreachy or, okay. That's the idea. So is my mic working now? Yes. Um, sorry new Zoom app, so it wasn't set right. Um, so yeah, I guess some of this you kind of already covered while I was doing my settings, but really I think getting to like the point of what this handbook is supposed to do, because a lot of communities that we work with have something like this, but it's used for different reasons. Like sometimes it's an onboarding document, which it sounds like what you're gravitating towards, but sometimes these things are governance documents, which basically boils down to who do I go to if there's a problem um, or something like that. So I think having the end goal in sight, are you setting up a governance document? Are you setting up an onboarding document? I think that would probably kind of reflect what the final product will be. So if that's the differentiation, governance or onboarding, I'm thinking of this more as an onboarding uh, document where someone coming new to a process can figure out how to actually do the things you do in the case. I just dropped a couple of links in the chat with uh, so the contributor site, I didn't realize it's not quite live yet, but there's a GitHub repository which has some of the, the details. And in particular, there's a getting started section that's uh, okay. quite robust. And then I also linked to two other things because as we were talking, Georg was mentioning like, you know, how we do chaos con and things like that. So there are two areas that uh, we've done a lot of documentation around the, the roles and how to do the things that we do around events. So organizing the contributor summit. So it's got some role handbooks in there and then some handbooks for what it takes to put together the, the release team and what each person does. So maybe those will give you some ideas for, for headings and categories. Was that the, that was the last link you put in? Uh, yeah, the last link is the release team one and the link above it is the events team. So those are both, those both oh, contain yeah. handbooks, role handbooks for each of those different areas, events and release. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think in general, a lot of open source projects, I mean, rather than calling them handbooks, maybe they'll have them like a different sections in their wiki pages. Um, but in addition to like events like ChaosCon, I can think of other like examples, like, you know, how do we do releases, right? Like what's involved? Uh, and, and I mean, I think we can probably come up with, I mean, you know, three to four topics where, where we can get get started. I mean, that might be a good way to sort of get started if people are in agreement about having a handbook or documentation on on how we how we work or how we want to work. Yeah. So I put um. Oops. If there's like three to four. So do you see in the minutes? There, yeah. Yeah. Like mentorship might be like how do we do that? How do we do chaos con our events? 
Um, honestly, community bridge and finances might be worth kind of articulating. It's, it's that is far from smooth at the moment, but it works. <laughs> and so maybe to Georg's point is, is when we write these down, we realize how convoluted <laughs> they, they in fact are. Um, and then the last one would I, oh, releases. So maybe that's the three to four. Yeah. High level things. All right, cool. Helpful, thank you. Um, kind of on this list still, um, clarify strategy for ChaosCon. Gare, do you want to speak to that a little bit? I just, I moved on just in the, we have a few things to get through today and in the hour. So ChaosCon, um, th there are two, two things here. One is we need to start with ChaosCon North America because the submission deadline for North, the Open Source Summit North America is, I believe, this week. And if you want to piggyback on that event, we should uh, at least start the CFP and make sure we have room and everything. Um, but when I talk about strategy, it's mostly thinking about the European conference because we hit the limit on the room that we were in. And we actually would have to downsize to 60 people if you wanted to stay in that room due to changes at the venue. And so the question is, do we want to grow the event more, which I think we have potential to do it. Um, but then we might lose some of the familiarity and the smallness of the conference where everyone bumps into everyone. Um, so those are just some questions in my head on um, think about where we want to take chaos con in the future. All right. Um, does anybody have thoughts on chaos con North America with, with respect to Austin in June or something along the June, I think. Have we talked to the Linux foundation to secure space and get ourselves no. on the but list I can of, do that. okay. Yeah. Because we want to get ourselves on the list of co-located events and make sure that yeah. we have a room for it. Although I think we should run our own registration for yeah. it. Okay. Um, chat with LF folks. Cool. That's usually a pretty painless conversation, to be honest with you. So um, day before, day after. I think the day before day is before. a Sunday, okay. isn't it? Doesn't it run? I think it runs Monday through Wednesday this week. I actually haven't looked. Uh, I was just looking at my event schedule, which I, of course, can't find right now. <laughs> it starts. On yeah, it's it's Monday through Wednesday. Yeah, you're right, Don. So. So we should target Thursday. Okay. Okay. And does it say where? Like, I can't find a venue. Yeah, it's the JW Marriott. Oh, it's at the hotel, not the convention center. I think I think so. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm crazy. I was looking at a whole bunch of events. I shouldn't. I shouldn't just keep talking like I know what I'm doing. So one of the. Yeah, it is the JW Marriott Austin, which is okay. right around the corner from the convention center. To be fair, it's not far away. Right. Um, so, uh, so one of my thoughts on Open Source Summit North America is, um, like, after being at the ChaosCon Europe, the the selection of people is so vastly different. I mean, they're just they're they're so different. Um, so, as you all know, as a Linux Foundation event, it's kind of a self-selecting group of people that attend that event, and obviously with Sustain and Fosdem and ChaosCon in between, it was just it was super different. Um, and I, it's just, it's an observation. <laughs> One is not better than the other. Um, so I don't know if we want to talk about that or if we care about that or. And yeah, yeah, there's very different contexts for sure. Personally, I think it's, I think it's kind of cool that they're, they're two very different events, but we do need to, we do need to make sure that we keep that in mind when we're organizing and selecting talks. But I think it's, I think it's kind of fun that the, the okay. one in Europe feels more kind of old school grassroots community E yeah. while well as the one it, with the open source summit feels a little more OSPO, you yep. know, 
oriented. Yep. And yeah. I think, yeah, okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm thinking like, I mean, ChaosCon registration is pretty minimal, but to come to open source, I mean, I don't know what the regular price is, but it's not cheap, right? That So that sort of excludes a lot of people. Um, and uh, I mean, people are spend a week in, in Brussels, but I mean, you don't really pay any registrations for you know, any of those events, right? So yeah, I mean, Sustain um, was the expensive one at a hundred dollars. Yeah, so <laughs> I I think yeah, I mean, it, it's the audience is is very different, like you said, and you know, yeah, I don't think anyone one of us are making value judgment, but yeah, I think we definitely attract different people and just okay. Yeah. Is the difference the the content of its Ildiko and I I think I I don't think I ever made it to the US ones of the Chaos Cons. I I was only in um in Brussels a couple of times. So is it is it only content and audience that's different or also the format of the events like what you're doing there or we're doing there is different? The types, of, the types of events are it just yes, the North American summit is just very much less developer centric, I would say, than not that the North America isn't developer centric, but Fosdem's like a super hacker kind of environment. It just it's very different. Am I right? Yeah, or so the, I... the format, Ildico, the format is the same. At least we've run similar. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, yeah it's the surrounding the... context is different. Yep. Sometimes some slightly different breakout rooms. I think fundamentally it's the same. Um, my take okay. on my take on the audience at Open Source Summit North America, I think, as Don pointed out, kind of ospo e. It's got a much more business-oriented flavor to it, to me. Um, versus in in Europe, I mean, if you take a look at the presentations we had, some of them were scientific-based, some of them were about the cash project themselves, some of them were. were you know, within business organizations themselves. So I just, it seemed like a broader suite of, uh, just a broader suite of, of, of things <laughs> in Europe. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a narrower band. I did think that just content wise, yeah. uh, in my opinion, I think this was probably one of the best ones we've had. It felt like I felt like all of the presentations were were super solid and really interesting, and I was I was really happy with the way it turned out. I thought it went really well. I I would second that. I and I love seeing the broad number of different ways that people are looking at the chaos project. I thought that was super interesting, and in the impact that it can have just beyond the OSPO. I thought the uh, presentations were all good. Uh, but I think something that was kind of missing that we've had in prior uh, conferences are the kind of the, the, the working group sessions where we were actually kind of getting work done. Uh, I, I would love to see more of that going, going forward, maybe kind of similar to the way Sustain did some of their sessions uh, and, and the way that we did them early on in, in the, the chaos, uh, chaos cons and the, uh, the events we had at uh, the uh, North America Summit. Mm -hmm. So then that would probably lead into the second point with ChaosCon Europe. So do we want to grow the event? And Kevin, I think that could probably address like growing in terms of having working sessions, um, breakout sessions. Um, I've been chatting with Tom Menz, who some of you probably met at ChaosCon. So he's at the University of Mons, closer to France, but he has good connections with folks in Brussels. And we're trying to find a site. I'm gonna put it in here, which is a possibility. It's very <coughs> cool looking. Um, it's in the chat. This is just an option, right? So it's part of the University Foundation. I'm not sure, I'm not sure which university, <laughs> but a well, university in the area. The it university like... of Interior Decorating. <laughs> <laughs> it looks pretty cool. <laughs> uh, 
okay. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's I just, it's actually closer than the FOSDEM location was to city center anyway. So I think it was just kind of outside of that loop. So I mean, location wise, it looked good. How much um, did we pay for, for EBUS? Uh, Georg? The rooms, I want to say were 450. Okay. And then for the catering and snacks and everything, that was 2,700. Okay. Because it looks like, so I don't know, maybe Tom can get us a deal, but it looks like 1,400 euros per day just for the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's is, a lot of meatballs. <laughs> which is super, super spendy. We're, we're on a budget here. But maybe maybe he's got an in and maybe they give discounts. Sure. A lot of times universities, if you know, if there aren't other people using it, you can get it for cheap to nothing. Yeah, I mean we got the Vancouver one for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so university seemed to be like pretty good approach. Mm -hmm. um, so do people have thoughts on making Chaos Con Europe bigger? I think you're gonna need to have a bigger room. I mean, I like the single track feel of Chaos Con, I kind of wish the North America summit was, our meetings were more like EU mm -hmm. um, in terms of atmosphere and communication and networking. I like that single track approach. Okay. Um, but you you physically need a bigger room. Okay. Um, you know, that would be the only thing I would change. And maybe I mean, a, like, a yeah, cooler like, room too? What? <laughs> maybe a cooler room? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Something with air. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think sort of maybe a little over a hundred ish, okay. maybe less than 150. Feels yeah. like sort of a sweet spot. Okay. Like, I, I wouldn't necessarily want it to be, we don't want it to be big. Okay. Um, and getting at Kevin's point, I wonder. I wonder if we should think about just doing some working sessions around the Open Source Summit North America where maybe we can get a meeting room, you know, just like a small meeting room or two. Yeah. And the people who are interested can like, not, not during ChaosCon, because I feel, like, I feel like the presentations are pretty useful at mm -hmm. ChaosCon and I feel like it brings more awareness to the chaos project, but I do wonder if maybe we should just do some, some working sessions. We could do it like, you know, maybe there'd be some space on, on Friday even. We could stay for an extra day and just do some, spend a day hacking on chaos stuff. Okay. I don't know, I'll I don't know what that would look like, but. I'll see if there are rooms available, if they have like breakout rooms. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, we could even, what we did uh, for some of the DNI stuff, uh, where was it? The Vancouver one, maybe? It was, because uh, Emma was yeah, there. Right. And it. and we just got together at some of the, we did during the event, which wasn't ideal. We just got together at the tables in the hallway and just kind of mm -hmm. hacked on metrics and talked okay. about what we wanted. I think we actually had a, we had a reserved space at Vancouver uh, for the for the full day. We did. We had a chaos um, poster, like in the conference facility. Yeah, that was really nice. Yeah, but what, it was the tables outside, though, right? Like in mm -hmm. the hallway. Yeah, right. it was two yeah, yeah. tables, but they were reserved specifically for uh, for us. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It wouldn't necessarily. We don't need privacy necessarily, so we wouldn't necessarily even need a room. Just like some space to okay. to hack on some stuff together. I like the idea of having one place to meet chaos folks throughout the day. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll also do a little bit of digging just in Brussels to see what other, just, you know, uh, an assortment of options. Maybe, I mean, I, honestly, for those of you that were at Sustain, I liked that place as well. And there, there are breakout rooms down. I never went into the basement, <laughs> but apparently there were rooms down there. So. I have no idea how much that costs, but that would be easy enough to find out. So.
Okay. There was also the space that we did it, uh, not last, not this year, but the year before, which I think was also quite small. I don't think it's big enough. Okay. And I don't know how well that sustained space would do in a presentation mode. You know, because it was the way they had it set up was like highly just um, in a huge circle or so in copy the, copy left was in that space. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was a, a presentation type conference. How'd that work? Oh, uh, actually worked quite nice. So the oh, big room. Yep, the... that, that main room was the, the main room and then they had uh, three or two other areas where they had uh, presentations going as well. So okay. basically three presentation spaces. All right, that's good to know. Okay, cool. Um, all right, okay, I'm gonna move on. So the next item was the develops a chaos certification for software implementing chaos metrics. So this is, um, as it sounds, I think, unless it doesn't make any sense as to what it sounds like, but um, to identify software as being chaos certified or uh, not compliant, what was the word? Chaos. Was it conformance program? Conformance, something along those lines. So chaos verified. Chaos conformant, I think, is what it was. I think that's the word. And so Georg. Yeah. I think we use conformance at the end. Could yeah. be verified or compliant or something that doesn't say it's certified. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Georg and Ildiko and I had a meeting with um, Steve Winslow from the Linux Foundation about what a program like this might look like. And we're re-meeting, we're meeting again I think this Friday with Steve and maybe Mike Dolan might join in as well as to just kind of what this might look like. So I think suffice it to say we're exploring this idea um, and we can bring information forward as it becomes a little bit more articulate and refined in a way that can be shared with people. Uh, Georg or Eldico, do you want to add anything? I think that sums it up. Okay. Um, and if anybody has an interest, of course, just ping me and I can certainly get you uh, included. Um, we also had a talk, I think it was last week, about metrics release cadence. So obviously, as a lot of you, as you all know, the metrics release is a, basically kind of on a six-month cadence, which used to be in line with <laughs> the conferences, but now that one of the conferences moved two months earlier, uh, the cadence got off a little bit. Um, so the one of the things that came up was um, moving away from just a twice yearly um, kind of a twice yearly approach towards a working group being able to release a metric, but doing this on an ongoing basis. And still, I think people can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but still twice a year, we would have kind of an official, like a large release of all the metrics that we could um, kind of send a signal that, you know, we're moving forward, but as common or evolution or risk would like to release metrics, um, they can do so in kind of these, these shorter, these shorter windows. Trying to, trying to make the whole process sort of less compressed and stressful and just make this like a routine was the idea. You know what people's thoughts are on this? And if you were on last week's call, can you tell me where I missed explanation on the edges? I think the, uh, the, only, the only issue I would have with it is with the, uh, and I mentioned this prior, the 30-day uh, the comment period we have for uh, metrics releases. I'm not sure what that would look like in a, in a rolling release where we're, where we're kind of releasing metrics one at a time. Okay, well actually, all right. Maybe one way to implement such a review period is that we have a section in our weekly newsletter saying these metrics are currently under review, please provide feedback. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I don't 
given the fact that I don't recall any of the new metrics even being discussed at CashCon EU, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure why we're tying them to the events, um, especially since the events and the metrics releases are all slamming together at the same time. And we're kind of stressed with travel already. Is that a shortcoming of the uh, the chaos kind of event? Should we be should we be discussing these metrics releases at the uh, at the events? I think that would be really boring. Yeah, <laughs> I I agree. I don't know if you should discuss them, but I just yeah. that they worked. So therefore, why are we why are we making our, ourselves crazy? Um, and I'm not saying adjust it to more times a, week, a year or even do a rolling release. I mean, you could do still twice a year and just pivot off the events. So do it at opposite times if you wanted to, if, if, if you still want to maintain a regular cadence. But I don't personally have a problem with a rolling release strategy either. OK. Thank you. I mean, maybe the, the twice a year is simply just a, a more of a marketing or a public announcement that's just saying, hey, don't forget, <laughs> our metrics are continuing to grow and we continue to refine them. And Yeah, and, and maybe you could have an announcement at the beginning of each chaos gone as part yeah. of the trajectory of remarks and say, hey, in the last half year, quarter, whatever you want to say, we did these. OK, cool. Um, it will also help to balance the speed at which one working group is advancing against the other. Because some working group might release faster following the release when you are ready to go. Some might be a little bit slower. So the two, year, the two releases per year will help to balance this uh, catch-up period. Because not all, the, the rele not all the working group will be releasing in sure. the same speed or pace. I think, yeah. that's, I think that's a fair point. Uh, and along those lines, I, I think uh, right now, a lot of the working groups do use the six month release as a forcing function to get stuff done. So if, if we remove that forcing function, uh, do, we, do we still have the, do we still have a, a regular releases? I think, I think it's, um... When the suggestion, and I guess I'm the person that started this discussion, the, the suggestion doesn't come from a lack of um, valuing the, the formal release cycle. It comes more from a, if we want to do like a patch release or there's a metric that becomes important, the six month cadence um, kind of prevents that. So we could treat it like, an, I mean, it should go through the same kind of rigorous process, but perhaps there, I guess just creating a mechanism where if a working group has some things they really want to get out there, um, and there's there there are reasons for that. Especially, I guess I'm thinking mostly from the risk perspective. There are there are metrics that I think are useful to the Linux Foundation between now and our next scheduled release. That if we could release them, it would be helpful. Okay. Um, because there's some a lot of activity in that that um, real time operating system and safety critical system space where um, being able to get a metric officially released through some process sooner than our release cycle, not necessarily as a routine would, would be helpful. Right now, we just don't have a way to do that. Maybe that's a better way to frame the question that came up. I'm gonna propose giving myself work. And I'm so I'm gonna- I'm in favor of that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna, propose that I come up with a one page proposal as to what this might look like to bring these thoughts together as to what a new release cadence might look like. Anybody object to me doing that work? No. <laughs> no, I didn't think anybody would. All right. Um, so then the last on the, hold on. the last on the, the uh, goals on this list was use cases and success stories of metrics in practice. I know, Gamer, you have some thoughts on this. So this is a, 
conversation I know we had in Vancouver and before and since on how do we get more specificity into the metrics that we define. So there's only a certain level that we can get to with our definitions because the metrics are very sensitive to the context they're used. If one used them a little different, interprets them a little different. And so how do we get those stories and those experiences out into others who want to start using metrics? And we have discussed in the past writing blog posts or asking people to write blog posts. And I know we have a strategy for that, but it's a kind of big ask of people who are already busy. And so I keep coming back to this idea to run interviews as or basically podcasts and invite people onto the podcast who have experience, who are doing metrics so that we can start sharing those stories. Um, and then we can use those podcasts and the, the minutes as a foundation for blog posts for those who just want to read about it. So there are multiple strategies that we can do here. I'm just thinking about how do we get those stories and experiences out and shared with others. Thoughts from folks on this? So I, I like the idea, you and I chatted about this in the airport. I like the idea of blog, or not blog posts. I like the idea of podcasts. So um, I think they're, they're um, fairly, from an interview perspective, fairly easy to run. Um, if you were to do them, you have experience doing interviews, so you have skills in that regard. Um, people like talking. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, true story. <laughs> so I, I think, and I also too, I mean, based on kind of what I have seen after ChaosCon in Europe, and just kind of following threads on Twitter, I think there's a lot of people who we could reach out to with pretty low overhead to just talk about their experience, whether it's in the project, within the Chaos Project might be an interesting podcast, or um, how the metrics are using are being used to um, in an organizational setting, how the metrics are being used, like Chaos Kind of You in a scientific setting, how they're being used in a foundation. I, I just I think there's so many people at this point that even just once a month might be really interesting. Yeah, nowadays podcasts are pretty low overhead, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can record it on Zoom and you can yep. post it somewhere, and that's it's pretty easy. I just yeah. did a podcast this morning. As a matter of fact, it was fun. Wow. <laughs> I to look it was fun. I just, I just got to talk about me for like 45 minutes. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, see, that's to my earlier point. <laughs> Everyone's favorite subject <laughs> themselves. Um, and I, I think we have enough people in the Chaos Project who have done these types of interviews or this type of work that they would be very interesting. So. From the format, I think we can have something like a panel of two or three of us and then inviting a guest and yeah. we rotate who's on the panel so that it's not a uh, individual person doing it, but the chaos project as a whole doing okay. the podcast. You know, um, do you remember when Sharon was doing the feather cast? Yes. That was like a couple of years ago. And I think I think maybe Ildiko, you were interviewed by Sharon. I don't remember. I got interviewed by her. Did you get interviewed? Yeah, yeah she put them on the Apache Feathercast. Yep. So, okay. you know, I mean, I think that's a good idea. Um, it would just have to be like speaking for my part, we would have to kind of stay vendor neutral in the conversations. Mm -hmm. But if we were just talking about metrics, yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, we could just keep it at that health and how to make things transparent and why we do this and, <laughs> you know. Okay, great. That seems very positive. So I think that's a 
the like that here or get a big thumbs up. So um, all right, so here we'll move move easily into a very low overhead topic of GDPR and ethics. <laughs> so, <laughs> ethics rule. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this came up, I want to say it was in common. Is that where it came up? And so um, just as obviously as, as metrics rely on a lot of public trace data, attention to GDPR and ethical issues around that data is, I think, something that, that we need to consider in the chaos project. Um, what that consideration looks like, a little like earlier, just, I'm not entirely, like a release cadence, what that looks like, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I think the general takeaway from, from the common talk was this is probably something that we shouldn't be talking about just in common, but probably something that has an impact to the project as a whole, um, all the pieces of software and the metrics. So. Yeah, it's one of the things that we talked about was, you know, maybe we want to put together some sort of best practices guide for using metrics that talks about GDPR and talks about people being able to delete their data if they want to. It talks about, um, you know, not necessarily having to collect personally identified identifiable data or not store it. Um, ethical concerns with using the data. I mean, maybe we want to put some something together so that we're not just delivering metrics. We're talking about like ethical uses of them. So, um, Don, would that be a, like a single document that would, at least in your mind, that would be just at the chaos website? Or would it be something that is put into every metric? No, I would see it as being something that's more um, more global across the entire project. So maybe something on the website, but maybe something that we link to from each release. Okay, gotcha. And maybe link to it from each of the like working group repositories or the software repositories. Okay. I think um, I'll just I'll just raise this as a as a recognizable risk of of. Of course, we want to comply with laws. Um, when people use tools, they want to know which of the folks working on the projects are actually doing things. And so is it our role to um, define how the tools and the metrics are used? And, and I think ethically, we should make a, it's useful to make a statement about that, but also not to pretend that um, projects aren't going to keep their own internal stuff with identifiable information. Like, I don't think that's not going to happen. No, I mean, and I don't think it's necessarily, we're not, we're not the police of how people use metrics, but right. I think, I think part of, part of being a project like this is helping people understand maybe the I ethics agree. associated with it. So I we're agree. certainly not going to go out and be like, no, you can't do that. That's not ethical. Um, but like on the on the Augur project, we have a privacy policy on our website, and and I think that as a chaos project, um, having a privacy policy is is that seems like the sort of bare minimum that people are doing right now, because technically we don't hold any personally identifiable information, but we have something to say about the ethics of it. Yeah. And, and but, as a, but as a tool builder, people that use the tools we build do hold personally identifiable information. And so I don't know, like, if I should be providing more explicit device, advice or um, a more explicit value statement on the appropriate use of these tools. And I think that's what some people will be looking for as they come to chaos and look at the metrics and try to build out the case for start using metrics within their organization or community, that they also will necessarily be asked about, okay, what's the ethics? What does the privacy sure. around starting to do this? How do we handle this? And so if they can find a one-stop shop at chaos, then they can, that, that we equip them, them with the answers to the questions they will be facing. Okay. 
Okay. Um, does anybody does anybody see this as a a long description? So if I use um, kind of Don's statement of helping people understand the issues associated with engagement, right? At this global declaration, do you see this as a does anybody see this as a long type of declaration, or is it? I mean, is could the first pass simply say, listen, you're, you're in a space where this is a concern. We it, for, almost pulled the stop. For, for Augur, we adopted the EFF's statement to our context. Can you, what is the statement? The Electronic Frontier Foundation's privacy statement. Let me see if I can find it. Is a privacy statement the but same? This is, this is more than a privacy statement. This, we're actually not talking about a privacy statement at all. What we're talking okay. about is more about, um, in general, about how to use the metrics that you gather in an ethical way. I think yeah. a bit of it is privacy, but it's yeah. also, um, I think it's also more than that. So if you think about, you know, for example, if you think about diversity and inclusion, if you're gathering data on a relatively small community, and you have really robust data about people that's very personal. You may accidentally out someone, for example. You may, yeah. people may be able to draw conclusions based on the stuff that you've provided in ways that you didn't expect them. Or they may use your data in nefarious ways that you didn't expect. And I think those are the kinds of things that we, so, we need to talk about in a document like this. But I think it's, it's not privacy policy. Like we're not, we're not making people adhere to anything. It's just these are the things you need to think about. These are the ethical considerations. This is maybe mm -hmm. maybe some guide rails that you might want to hold your project to as you gather data. I, I okay. I, I, I'm sorry, yes, I'm I'm less conflating the two now. Uh, there's a there's a lot that's been thought about, obviously, by a lot of people. I don't I'm sure each of us probably knows somebody who's done work thinking about this. I have one colleague in um, Copenhagen, Irina Schlosky, who does Facebook posts called The Daily Creepy, where she, you know, identifies some current in the news way that data is, data about people like this is not being used, uh, well, it's being used in a creepy way. And I think, I think kind of, I don't think all of us would necessarily even think of the creepy ways to use this data or the inappropriate ways. Um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe there's someone in this group who could speak to that and help us get started. So Georg has offered. Thank yeah, you. I care a lot about this issue as well because I I collect a lot of data about people. So and I take Georg, that responsibility pretty seriously. I'll put um, together a first draft of an outline with some bullet points uh, and that gives us something to start working on. Yeah, I think I, I had, when I wrote that, action item, maybe just like even what the headings of that document might be, uh, as simple as that. Okay, thank you, Georg. Thank you, everybody, for your feedback on that. Um, I'm gonna skip software updates for just a second here. Um, did I bring up the potential to have one East Asia community call per month? I've had this did. one. You did, you raised that at, at ChaosCon, I think. So what would folks think about, so right now we obviously meet at this exact time every Tuesday for the community call. Um, what would people think of, of me like using one of these Tuesday calls to do an international meeting? Obviously, did I bring this up last week? I don't remember at all. I either think about these things in my head or Last week we did talk about it. Oh, we did. Okay, so it wasn't just me, me, myself, and I on that conversation. No, no, I remember. I was there. I, I remember it, or it came to me in a dream, and I okay. remember it. <laughs> just communicating across the dream space. Because I'm dreaming about you all the time, Matt. <laughs> um, should I just? How about this? I mean, should I? What are people's thoughts? Should I just ha add a, an additional meeting? I honestly don't mind doing it. It would just be very early in my morning. And it would probably be a very short meeting because it would just be an update meeting, most likely. Or should I actually think about using one of like one of the Tuesday slots and just canceling the meeting on a Tuesday? See what I'm saying? Canceling this meeting, but actually running it. I would maybe do it as an additional meeting. Okay. 
Only to not screw up our ability to remember which Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, and also to see what kind of traction you're going to get. Um, okay, before I cancel this. Yes, and <laughs> in, in my experience, it's a little bit, um, you always want to have the, the Asian meetings for people to get more participation, but in a lot of cases, they're not, not particularly well attended. Okay. Um, I think it's I think it's for a couple of reasons. I don't know how much traction a lot of projects have, and um, a lot of a lot of people for which English isn't their first language would prefer to communicate in a written form, okay. as opposed to meetings. But that may not be true. Other other projects have really successful meetings in other other areas. But I would I would test it out before you make okay. any changes. I'll send something to the list then. That would just be a basically a fifth community call mm -hmm. meeting for the month or and it would just be once a month it would not be a, a weekly thing by any means and i'll okay that's fair and i'll just yeah. test it. Okay. man in terms of time i mean i think you said like it would be early morning your time like wouldn't it be actually later in the evening your time yeah. or okay then later in the evening my time. <laughs> no i'm just i'm just asking i like, wake up yeah. 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 maybe i wake up super early <laughs> <laughs> When Kate Stewart and I tried to do this with uh, Jessica Wilkerson and the risk group, it was like, I think, a 7 p.m. our time call. Yeah. Yeah, it would be evening your time. Okay. Race, right? It'll be like, I would assume it'll be like four or five Pacific times. So it'll be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It'd be really early in the morning in Europe. Or... Yeah, usually the Asian meetings end up being like 4 a.m. my time. Okay. Yeah. Based on the, the Kubernetes ones, which I'm. Love y'all, but not dialing in for that one. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I just in terms of events, I just wanted to let you know that we've had a few acceptances to the member summit. So Sean and I had a talk accepted that's going to talk about the badging program and also the work that's being done in risk. So it's a the talk is about how to bring metrics into practice. So how do we get them kind of what I talked about at ChaosCon in Europe, the concerns of metrics living alone, but how do, what, what are the efforts we're doing to get them into practice? Um, and then Georg, you had a panel talk accepted around DNI. is that correct? I don't know. Which event is that, Matt? You don't know? You did. Congratulations. I mean, not yes, you do, because I got the email too since I'm on the panel. Um, so, so the DNI panel was accepted at the member summit. I love member to, summit. I need to uh, update, uh, read my emails. Yes. <laughs> and Armstrong, this is the member summit that used to be the leadership summit that used to be the collab summit. <laughs> okay. So it's the kind of the March, February, March um, kind of members, members of the Linux Foundation meeting. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, were there any others? I, that's why I put this on the, were there any others that I didn't have on my radar? For that, um, are people planning on submitting to Chaos, not ChaosCon, to OSS North America? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll submit something. Okay. Yeah, me too. It, it yeah. won't be metrics related, but uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, wh yeah. When is the deadline? I don't know. This it's Sunday. This, yeah, it's this weekend. Oh, so it's the same deadline with the Linux, uh, the main event. Because the main event, I think, is the 17 or 16. I think we're talking about. That's what we're talking about is the main event. Okay. So February 15th, I'm guessing. Okay. But usually, uh, Kioscon runs its own uh, CFD, right? Yeah. We have not started that yet. Yeah. Yeah, that ChaosCon has not started yet, Armstrong. Okay. And then um, lastly, the just because we're running out of time, just in terms of the mentorship stuff. So the Google Summer of Code application is in. We have not heard, you know, how they do the organizational awards. Like they, they announce the organizations. I don't think those have been announced yet. Um, so thank you for everybody for putting together the list of proposed ideas and the associated mic micro tasks um, with them. And then for outreachy, 
That has, so Georg, more than me, Georg and I spent time in a uh, kind of a Twitter event earlier today. It was just about introductions with mentors and mentees and alums from the outreachy program. Um, Georg, I, I had suggested that we just duplicate the Google Summer of Code ideas for Outreachy. Um, Outreachy is only going to be one mentee. That's because that's all the funds that we have for. So one of the things that I'm going to do, so a couple changes that I think we need to do. One is the issues assigned with the micro tasks, kind of looking at, at you, Sean, for the auger stuff. Yeah. You know how you, you, know how you have that issue. Yeah. Can you, can you rename that issue to be like mentee issue or mentorship issue? Right now it's named Google Summer of Code issue. Okay. Or Google Summer of Code micro task or something. Yeah. What do you can want you it to be called? Mentorship micro task or whatever. Uh, um, mentorship micro task? Something more high level. Than Google Summer of Code, because then the issue can handle comments from outreachy folks as well as Google Summer of Code folks. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'll ask the same for folks with Remore Lab. So that's that. And then, um, uh, another thing. Oh, Georg, I think. What would you think about, you know how like the people, the potential mentees fill out that um, table about the work that they have done? Yep. What would you think about adding a column that says, you know, program applying to Google Summer of Code or Outreachy? Um, right now that table is Google Summer of Code specific. I'm thinking about having two separate sheets or two oh, that would be fine too so the, the question i have is um which one is easier for the stu students to tease out okay and i think if we have one here's how you apply to google summer code and then enter is easier than which program do you want and then you have to select them okay well two then we can sort that out we're at the top of the hour. So these are just the things I think there's just a little logistical work that needs to be done to at one point combine these, but at one point keep them separate mm -hmm. from one another. So thank you very much for everybody's uh, input. I certainly appreciate it. And it's good to see everybody. And I'll talk to you all soon. Talk to you all soon. Thank uh, you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.